right, discussing what went wrong with professional wrestling, specifically WWE, but of course, at least from my perspective, that always transcends into other promotions. Uh, we'll start, of course, there's a fucking plane overhead, just when I start, but WCW, 1997, uh, I believe that's when Eric Bischoff really came into, quote, storyline, quote, power with the New World Order. It's been well documented that this is actually going to the roots of Eric Bischoff, coming into power with the NWO and more or less supplanting the Ted DiBiase uh, character, Billionaire Ted, as the heel leader, behind the scenes leader of the NWO, the New World Order. What does that have to do with anything now? Because of Bischoff was pretty successful and pretty uh, unpopular, I guess you'd say, uh, in a successful way with that role. Vince McMahon kind of took that ball and ran with it, uh, going to the Montreal screw job, planted the seeds, and then uh, the day after WrestleMania uh, 14, really coming into power against Hulk. I mean, I'm sorry, Steve Austin. I'm getting so confused. But basically, McMahon. Austin feud really took off that whole, you know, commissioner or boss or owner of the company as the top heel. Now that's all well and good for that time. However, what happened was WWE got lazy and it's been said that um, some network executive at the USA Network, uh, female executive liked the McMahon family in these positions of on-screen talent. But because the McMahon-Austin thing was so successful, Vince will eat himself. Uh, basically, he was too successful in that we all became trained or programmed to think of owners or commissioners as the top heel in the company. And it was no longer wrestlers that were the focus. Uh, wrestlers, championship wrestlers defending titles, was no longer who was really running the show. Now, for today's fan, I can imagine, and this is not condescension, I'm just saying, I can imagine that you can't imagine what wrestling's like without a commissioner of SmackDown or a Raw general manager or a SmackDown general manager for WWE and for other commissions as well, uh, prom promotions, Jim Cornette, Ring of Honor, TNA, Bruce Pritchard coming out, Dixie Carter, you know, all these characters on the mainstream shows and and if you go to indie shows which i do you see a lot of indie promotions have all types of commissioners or presidents or general managers um and the the point is those characters don't really work because you can't have a payoff of a match and if you do have a payoff of a match it's either that they have a, a bad guy wrestler or a heel wrestler wrestling on their behalf or you have them wrestling a gimmick match but they're not usually not a very talented wrestler themselves and if they were why aren't they just wrestling the point is that the emphasis has been taken away from championship belts such as let's say the traditional rick flair or the traditional harley race who's defending the championship as a heel that guys are chasing the guys that you want to beat them nikita koloff magnum ta dusty whoever or in the wwf you could say if you wanted Greg Valentine or Morocco or, or some bad guy, Piper, to face Hogan, or if you wanted, you know, um, whoever, you know, uh, you wanted uh, the bad guy chasing the good guy, uh, George Steele uh, chasing Bruno or Ivan Koloff challenging Bruno, whatever. The point is that emphasis from the championship belt is gone away. It's been diminished. Because now the big concern, and I think it's really the promotions, the WWE especially, they want to make us think, or they think that we care who the Raw general manager is. Oh my God, Kurt Angle's calling the shots on SmackDown. Well, obviously it's a facade. We can see through that. He's just playing the role. But all those times with interviews, all that lengthy promo time of Kurt Angle discussing who's going to wrestle who, all these backstage vignettes, which I have another issue with, um, which I guess I'll get into now, uh, but all that stuff takes time away from the actual wrestling. And you say, well, you got a three-hour show to fill, but everybody's getting sick or well past sick, 10, 15 years worth of being sick of these lengthy opening segments of interviews and promos in the ring. Now, if you want to talk about, or I'll talk about, um, the backstage vignette is one of those deals which I think has gone on too long and too far. 
you have these backstage vignettes and they're basically like, well, you're going to wrestle such and such and you're going to wrestle such and such. And we've talked about this where the wrestlers aren't aware that there's a camera right in front of them or they're acting like they're aware that there's, they're not, you know, there, there's a camera right in front of them, but they don't address the crowd for the most part, or they tongue in cheek do like the rock used to or Jericho. But it's like um, their little, you know, shenanigans or their mischief with the heels is never acknowledged by the good guy. Like, oh, yeah, I saw you on the monitor saying that about me. Or, yeah, I saw what your little plan was because the camera picked it up. It's this weird, you know, fourth wall thing, which it kind of goes to uh, that Ultimate Warrior in the Mirror thing from Nitro 20 years ago, which is who's supposed to be aware of what? And it gets too complicated. So, really, if you think about it, uh, back in the day, if you can imagine that a Ric Flair or a wrestler like that, a championship wrestler, was the man. Like, Ric Flair was the president. I mean, he had a lot of fucking pull in young people's lives. And, and it sounds far-fetched to wrestling fans now, but you would think that, yeah, Ric Flair is the fucking man. Like, you would think that way. That would be in your thought. If you were a wrestling fan, you had a lot of respect for a Ric Flair in that championship. And if he lost to Ronnie Garvin or Dusty Rhodes, it was a big fucking deal in your goddamn life. And now nobody gives a flying cunt. So if you're talking about things like you deserve it and all that stuff it's just a different way of interpreting wrestling it's a different way of presenting it and it's really not the fans fault it's it's, it's basically you can blame Bischoff for this one for putting himself over with the NWO and then blaming McMahon and once those storylines ran their course the Austin McMahon angle what they could have done and should have done perhaps is taken it down a notch and and not been so persistent and so all-consuming with the McMahon characters as this, uh, the powers that be or uh, the authority figures. They should have just allowed wrestlers, it could have even been Triple H when he was having that reign that everyone hated him, or whatever, allow the fucking wrestlers to be the star of the wrestling show. When you make the wrestling commissioner or general manager the star, the main heel, you're going against Roland Barthes, uh, the perfect bastard. 1972, I believe, Roland Barthes wrote a philosophy, French philosopher, about the perfect bastard. Allow your bad guy to be your bad guy. Allow the wrestlers to wrestle and be the focus of the talent. It's like a producer who wants to act in his own movie. Unless you're Clint Eastwood or whoever, uh, Sylvester Stallone, that's not going to work all the time. And you can say, well, the McMahon character's awesome. It's great. Yeah, the first time. But not year in, year out, to get to the point of Linda McMahon, uh, Stephanie and Shane. Um, you know, and they, they're all good. I'm not saying they're horrible. Uh, Linda's not particularly great. Uh, no offense to her as a character. But uh, just, to, just to basically diminish the pro wrestlers, or sports entertainers, and build up the general manager character, I'm just saying over and over again, but you've taken that balance away uh, back in the day, if you saw Jack Tunney on TV once a year, or, or twice a year, whatever the fuck, that was a big deal. To sign Andre and Hogan contract, to sign Andre and Ultimate Warrior contract, see Jack Tunney. If you saw Bob Geigel getting punched by Magnum TA, that was a big deal. These promoters uh, were kind of in the background. A lot of things just happened without them. And I don't think wrestling fans today can understand that you used to do just fine having angles develop where the matches just happened naturally or more organically or yeah it just seemed like they were just thrown together somehow and it happened because the main pursuit was a championship title match now and the other thing i hate is uh break aparts and and try to explain this so many times like the casual break apart where kurt angle will say you don't wrestle this guy and you don't wrestle this guy you don't fight they're always doing this thing where the wrestlers are encouraged not to make body contact or not to fight each other. But does not is that what wrestlers are supposed to do? There's always this thing where the wrestlers are not supposed to have conflict. Don't have conflict. Don't don't fight. Don't or you can't fight because I'm going to put you in a tag team match or we're going to save this for the pay-per-view or you're going to have to beat this but it's always this weird thing of discouraging what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to fight each other. Uh, they're supposed to have conflict. And, and so I think that's one thing that, that I can get into another time, but maybe now just, if you're going to have a fucking wrestling match, have the conflict. And to have this kind of pissy, pissy pat, pissy pat, that's a good one, of we don't want the wrestlers to actually fight each other until the pay-per-view, 
but the pay-per-view is just it's diminished now itself because of the whole 999 routine and the network at least with wwe uh, it just gets to be too convoluted and too confusing why not just let them fight all the time well that's a whole other thing you want to just want anarchy but um you know once again blah 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 so that's uh i don't know if i answered all my questions to you um but basically if we're gonna if you're gonna say well what's wrong with wrestling now i'm just telling you it's it's there's a lot wrong with pro wrestling and sports entertainment now if you have to call it that and one of the things i don't know if i was eloquent because i didn't make notes but just the fact that we've taken away all that gusto and machismo and importance on the wrestling champion the wrestling heel champion in this particular case it could be the face champion too and put all that emphasis and energy on these general manager and commissioner roles that's the problem so vince will eat himself he had to put himself over he had to look at all the wrestlemanias he's fought bret hart Shawn michaels hogan his own son shane uh, how many WrestleMania matches has Vince has? And he's lost every single one. That's fine. But he he always has to be in the mix because he thinks he's Ric Flair. Vince thinks he's, and when I say Ric Flair, I don't mean literally Ric Flair. I mean he's the main focus of heat, of bad guy energy. It, it's just, it, it gets to be redundant. And you've got a whole generation of emasculated wrestlers. And what does that mean? Well, look it up. Emasculated means you have your balls cut off. So all these heel champions that could have been something, whether it's, Kevin Owens or whoever, um, they've been emasculated because they haven't been the top heel. The heel's always been the McMahons for the last 15 or, or pushing 20 years now. And that's one of the reasons why Vince will eat himself and wrestling is just not as good. I'm sorry, it's just not as good. So I don't have a solution right now. Maybe I'll work on a solution later, but enjoy your Sunday. Mike Messier, once again.